Okay. Um, so we next on our agenda is discussion of the of the 2022 draft RIPA report. And I, I think, I don't believe DOJ has a presentation uh, planned or is that is that the case? Uh, we do not have one planned. Um, it's open for all of you, but we are happy to jump in to try to okay. answer questions or. Okay. So we, uh, um, I guess why don't we open it up now to board members? Uh, we've we've the report was circulated to us and, and I'm sure everyone has reviewed it and and perhaps we can offer feedback and comments to uh, to the DOJ research staff and and our legal staff that's writing the report um, uh, so they can revise accordingly. So the floor is open. Andrea. Well, first I want to, yes, thank you. Uh, so I want to thank all of the DOJ staff that worked on this report. It is voluminous, it is in progress, and um, I can see how it is, uh, it is improving by leaps and bounds every time we see parts of it. So uh, really well done, a lot of good work being done there. I wanted to particularly uh, thank you for the robust landscape setting that you do at the beginning of the report and the, in the intro, I think that that, um, you, you heard us when we said we wanted to lay the context for what was an unusual year with the pandemic and, um, and, and, and then to think about racial and identity profiling in that context. So I thank you for that. I also really appreciate all of the good work done around um, the transgender policy conversation that's in the report and and the research that was done. I go on, on mute now, <laughs> but I just wanted to express that gratitude for that deep work on those those two areas. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. Uh, any who would like to go next? Well, I have I have some minor uh, technical suggestions. I too uh, was very impressed by the report, and I, I think each year um, it is amazing how much uh, substantive ground is being covered in, in the report, in addition to the data work. Um, but but being the the kind of resident data nerd, I, I just had a, a couple of technical suggestions um, for uh, for the reporting. I, I did notice in this year's report that there's a a, a move between it looks like reporting odds ratios and reporting differences, and sometimes the the language refers to percentage point differences, and sometimes it's percent differences. And I think there's even some results when you're doing multivariate analysis where it looks like there's uh, there's results expressed in terms of odds ratios, and I, I think that that might be a little less except either either will will require more explanation. Uh, so um, readers that aren't, aren't statisticians will, will be able to get the gist or, or maybe perhaps uh, going back to the format from last time. I'm thinking in particular the tables on um, like, for example, page 45 and parts um, on page, uh, page 37 as well. So, so I, I would suggest perhaps just, just picking one and, and sticking with it. Other than that, I, I thought I, I was also very, very impressed with the, the report that the staff has, has put together uh, up to this point. Next version. Thank you. I also, oh, I'm sorry. sorry. Go ahead, Lily. Oh, okay. Well, I also, yeah, I'm really pleased at how the sections have come through. They're more and more developed. I've said this before, but I really appreciate the explicit references to agencies that have taken actions and a concrete, ex ex narrow but very important example was 
the years that CHP or um, agencies in Connecticut have prohibited consent searches. So I appreciated the, the <clears throat> in the report, really giving that background, because um, I think it will point to recommendations or actions the board may be taken. Um, I had an even narrower comment than Steve's about the odd ratios. I was thinking about the color. So when I can view things in color, for example, the bar graphs are very visible and I realized I didn't print one out in black and white, but I encourage if there's a default color combination that the software will assign where it's, when it's printed out in black and white, the contrast is also clear. This is such a very narrow comment, but as we're really aiming towards clarity, because um, I'm hoping so many people will be viewing this report and extracting information, information from it. And then I just had a question. I know we know that there are placeholders for some data analysis to come. We can see the scope of the report has really, you know, it's grown dramatically. I heard the reference earlier from board member to the sheer volume and really appreciate the efforts. But I was w wondering if someone could remind me with the time, someone from DOJ, the time frame um, for these last, um, you know, occasionally where it's highlighted in yellow and it says data analysis is to come and how those align with the subcommittee the subcommittee meetings. I'll Allison. say I think it might be helpful if Kevin could give those timelines. Okay. Um, but this has to do with the issue um, with having to rerun the data because of the, um, <coughs> because of the glitches with Oakland and CHB. That's right. And I'm so, I mean, of course, I'm sorry that that, it's un unfortunate that it happened, but I really appreciate that that it was flagged and there's an effort to fix it. I'm thinking of, for example, some of the discovery rate analysis, um, and it doesn't have to be very precise time frame. I guess I'm just asking if it fits into, is there a time frame that aligns with the subcommittees having a chance to look at those before the, sub, the subcommittee meetings? Kevin, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, I, I actually do have a question. I had to jump off when we were talking with the subcommittee co-chairs on Monday, I had a hard stop and we were talking about the scheduling of the next Stop data subcommittee meeting. Uh, what, Allison, what was the week that we were shooting for with that? Do you so recall? We are aiming to have, and you will all receive a doodle poll later this week to try to firm up the dates. Um, so we appreciate very prompt responses to those if we can. Um, we are aiming to have both the stop data and the policies subcommittee meetings the second week of November. So that gives us a few weeks ahead of Thanksgiving to incorporate any board member feedback or suggestions. And so um, by those meetings, and Kevin can give further detail about this, we expect to have the date include the data analysis in those sections of the report. That's correct. Yes. Okay. I just wanted to make sure I still recall. Uh, the correct timing. So second week of no November, those subcommittee meetings, uh, the, the idea is to, uh, the meeting materials for those meetings will include um, the sections that are placeholders currently, um, and it will reflect the updates that the department had to make when rerunning the analyses based on the updates with the data transmission error. So it will reflect the uh, data that is current um, so that the subcommittees can discuss it at those subcommittee meetings. So. We are on we are on track to get those distributed. What does it sound like? Two weeks or so from now. What was it? Three three weeks from now for the eighth meeting. So our week of the eighth meetings. Okay, great. Okay, do we have any further comment on the report? I have, a, I have some, thank you. Um, and I have some little languagey things that I can just send in an email to DOJ. We don't need to discuss them. Thank you guys, again, echoing what was already said about the extent of the report digging into a lot of very important issues. The work going into this is tremendous. I really appreciate everything that's been done. I don't know if we included in the past the like little call out boxes with narratives about people's lived experiences with some of these issues but I really found them very powerful in, in this version. If they were included, I just must have glossed over them, but I think they were very powerful in here, particularly demonstrating around the difference in experiences for transgender folks um, and how they are policed. 
So I really thought that was very valuable, added a lot. Um, so just, I'll just go through with some of the suggestions that I had. Um, in the, on page 37, when we're talking about the multivariate analysis, and I think just elsewhere where we're talking about differences and um, disparities that are observed, to the extent they're consistent with results year over year, it might be useful to say that, you know, this is consistent to what we saw with what we saw, you know, the disparity, the, di the directional disparities in, you know, 2019, 2020, et cetera. Um, so, you know, it's not just a, a, a new phenomenon that's being observed. Um, uh, when we're talking about the transgender, policing of transgender individuals in the proposed legislation, um, just to flag that if, if SB 357 isn't signed into law this year, which is mentioned, um, that it would be potentially useful for the for the next year's report to track the disparities along uh, the same lines you already identified in stops for sex work type offenses specifically, um, so that we can know kind of if it's, if it doesn't pass, then that we would it, it would kind of give the 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 um, language of this says that they want to track kind of what's going on with this legislation both in California and elsewhere, and so. Um, continuing to track that kind of information would be helpful to understand like what the impact would have been had it passed, even if it doesn't um, pass this year. Um, uh, this is like a question. Well, one thing that was very striking to me was the observation of the differences that young people experienced in the way that they're policed. Like they were more subject to consent searches, more subject to other types of things. And given that next, just as an idea for, for the next year's report, um, given that so many new agencies are coming in, I want—I don't know how many of those reflect like school police or other um, entities where there's going to be more, con uh, more data points about how folks are policed in and around schools. Um, I think it'd be great to include kind of more of a, of a, of a close look on that kind of information um, in next year's report if we have that data coming in. Um, and when we're talking about the ADA section on policing um, people experiencing homelessness, um, the exact one of the examples that's given is, I think, on page 75, um, examples of illegal arrests and violations by AD, of the ADA by law enforcement officers, and it mentions a store owner calls to report that an apparently homeless person is in front of the store, people are complaining, he is talking to himself, but he's he has a mental illness and is violating no loitering laws. Um, in reality, there's almost always going to be a law that some, that exists that's on the books that someone can be violating. So I think the fact, I think that's a high standard to say he's violating no loitering laws. I think if the focus of RIPA and um, the, and the, the definition of bias that we have is whether or not not whether there's no basis to do to conduct a stop, but rather if if something about an individual's identity is impacting the likelihood that the stop will, will happen in the first place or the actions taken, I think um, it might be better or provide to provide some examples um, about how the fact that someone is experiencing homelessness makes them more likely to be subject to these things in the first place, not that um, they are subject to this with no, without um, basis. So I think both things are are true, and by just just in terms of trying to think of examples where the where officers engaged in biased policing um, that would violate the law, at least in California, I think that's an additional category of examples. Um, there's lots of times people are outside of of um, buildings. There's lots of times that people have things on the sidewalk that are blocking um, folks, you know, egress, and are not stopped or have that have their material um, detained, um, taken from them, et cetera. Um, I appreciated the best practices policies for the rec recommendations for policies. I think, though, on page 77, when it discusses the board beginning to explore evidence-based best practices related to police interactions with individuals perceived to have disabilities and alternatives to police responses, I think there's much more uh, evidence-based material on alternative forms of response, and we actually do talk about that substantially in the report later on. So I think that should be something that's highlighted here as well, that the, the solution is not just to teach officers how to engage with people experiencing mental health crises, crises or other disabilities better, but also 
let's find ways and support ways of you know de de redirecting those responses completely. And again, it's already discussed in more detail in the report. So I think highlighting that as like maybe the first alternative and even saying like, as we further discuss in the report in section X, um, but I think that should be highlighted here too as kind of the probably first step in addressing these. Um, one, one additional recommendation that I don't think is in here is noting that dis discontinuing the use of specialized units for that essentially have the purpose of like, outreach teams to deal with folks um, in these categories. Um, I think also when we're talking about options on page 78 it mentions there are a few foundational principles agencies may wish to include in their policies. I think we also might want to be suggesting direction to municipalities. I think that's um, what exists kind of in the later subsection uh, in ways that municipalities can address these issues differently, but I think that might be a place to also put it here. Um, I think for subsection, I think some stronger language might be useful in some of these places. So for instance, mentioning that on page, this is also on page 78, that policies may include language on the importance of not criminalizing those with mental health disabilities. Um, just because someone appears to have a disability or appears on how that's illegal. So I think it's not just like, it's important not to do this thing. You're violating the law if you do that thing. So I think let's make, like we can have some stronger language there. Similarly, I think on page, uh, I don't know, there might've been some other examples of that, but just that was one that stuck out for me. Um, other potential suggestions could be also having the agency or the supervisor um, withdraw or not submit charges to prosecuting agency if it's on the basis of mental health crisis. So that there's like a layer of review, not just um, directing the individual patrol officer to act a certain way, but also putting um, obligation on the supervising officers to back up that kind of policy, as well as, again, kind of in the larger category of directions to municipalities have prosecuting agencies adopt policies that reject um, charges if they are referred to on those grounds. Um, on page 81, the second to last bullet point about training officers how to properly use time, distance, and cover, um, I think should also reflect that officers are required by law to use these techniques um, instead of force when feasible, and that California law prohibits officers from using deadly force when such techniques are available. So that's recognizing AB 392 exists and has an impact on how departments have to police. Um, I, I had a, just a question. So I really appreciate it on when we talk about the um, pro, pro policies and accountability section, how the intro now includes the full extent of what bias policing is. It's not just stopping, it's taking any action. And it's also um, uh, just influenced by, not totally driven by the fact of someone's identity. Um, but I wasn't sure if the analysis of the policies indicated um, whether or not the, they also captured that distinction or that, that full, the full definition of what is bias policing under California law. Um, I don't know. Um, it may, maybe it already captures that, and that's included in like the check marks. But I just wasn't sure if that was true, and I think that's relevant, particularly when you get further along in the um, evaluation of complaints, because if it's not part of the department's policy, if someone's doing a thing, it's not going to be sustained as a violation of that policy. Um, so it's, I think it it has further downstream impacts how exactly the department is defining it, and so knowing whether or not their definition includes all of these other actions as defined under California law is relevant. So it could already be captured in there, but it was just not clear to me um, whether or not that is true when they're evaluating the sufficiency of the policy. Um, on page 113, it, it mentions um, that 16 agencies use commercially available racial bias-based policing policies purchased from a vendor. And again, I think this is pretty sure this is Lexipol, and we talked about previously like saying Lexipol, and I think it's important that it be identified as the entity because folks who are not deeply versed in this will have no idea that this is um, who this is who they're talking about here. And I think when it was a question of whether or not we 
did that. We, I think we've done that in prior reports. We did identify Lexapol as, you know, an, an actor here, and I think it's important that we do so. So I would strongly ask that that be specifically added. Um, on the uh, accountability portion, when we're talking about auditing or confirming the accuracy of of officers' um, data collection for for the RIPA data. The, one of the proposals is to review body cam footage for filing out data if it's not done immediately. And that actually kind of is in conflict with best practices around um, body cams, which is not to allow officers to review body cams prior to giving a statement on an incident. Um, obviously, not all stops are going to result in complaints or criminal or civil um, proceedings, but I think given that it's uh, unclear you know, when and where that will happen, I think it's better probably to just insist on or as a best practice to be contemporaneously doing it um, rather than potentially undermining other types of investigatory actions by having them re re refer to the body cam footage um, for later. Um, and um, when we're talking about the community review boards or critical incident review boards, just one thing to be thinking about is, um, especially when we're talking about best practices, most effective, it, what is the goal here? Is the goal the appearance of legitimacy, which is definitely a benefit that comes from using some of these boards, or is it having a real difference in outcomes? Um, and so just even identifying what is actually achieved and if it is difference in outcomes, like what is, how is that demonstrated in these different jurisdictions? Um, and it, how, how is ability to actually impose discipline rather than review and just opine on the appropriateness of use of force, uh, part of the consideration of whether or not something is actually a best practice for civilian oversight and is it an effective civilian oversight mechanism. Um, those were my main substantive comments. Again, I have like little things that I can just um, include in, in an email. But I guess my one question that was not necessarily covered by any existing element of the report was just um, thinking whether it might be useful, even if not in this report, but in the f future reports to include something that actually discusses the access to the public of the information that's uh, being collected here. I think this report is amazing. It gets this information out to folks in ways that would never be possible otherwise. So many agencies over the past have had to collect data almost identical to what's being collected here and nothing is done with it. So the fact that it's available to the public on the dashboard, it's available to the public in the report form, it's amazing and it allows for so much um, more advocacy to be done. Um, but I'm also curious as to, you know, RIPA, this analysis was always intended to be like a first step, right? We intended for local jurisdictions, whether they be agencies or members of the public advocates, um, to conduct additional analyses. And so just trying to understand like how, how are people getting access to this data? How are they, are they able to? And I wanted to say from like our personal um, experience from the ACLU, like we've honestly had a hard time getting access to some of the data that extended beyond some of the analyses that are already included in here. Um, and working with other organizations have had difficulty getting some, some of the data. And so, um, you know, we're attorneys, other folks have, you know, full-time, you know, IT staff able to like try to work on this and we're having a hard time. So trying to make sure that it's accessible to other folks who don't have those resources as well, um, to the full extent that was intended by, you know, the passage of this. So just um, happy to think through what might be some relevant things to think about and then ultimately suggestions that could be made by the board to facilitate more access. Um, but I think that might be something that could be useful also to include in the report um, for future. So thank you, that was a lot. Um, but I thought this was amazing. It's gonna be so useful for folks doing the work on the ground to really have this information and have these recommendations. So really can, thank you so much for all of this. Thank you, Melanie. Uh, are there other, other uh, comments on the report or comments on the comments of the report. I 
I would say just to the latter point um, that um, that uh, board member Ochoa raised, it might be interesting to perhaps uh, think about trying to come up with some instructional videos on on how to download it, software that could be used to call it. It, it is a large file and it's available on Open Justice, um, but it, it's it's hard. The barriers to, to analyzing it, you know, requires some some knowledge of of using statistical software and so. We could imagine trying to put together a resource guide that would help people get started in their analysis. Okay, can I? Can we ask? Uh, are any other board members? Uh, do we have any further comments on the current draft of the report? Joe sure, Raphael, this is a. Uh, uh, Co Chair Swing, I have a, just a comment on a couple of the sections, especially with our work on the Stop Data Committee. Um, I, I like the uh, increased uh, information that's available on calls for service, and uh, just like a more a more in depth uh, review of how um, calls for service uh, are differentiated between uh, officer initiated activity. I think that's an important distinction to understand. And then also uh, on page 31. In the residential population comparison, uh, the report refers to factors of, of differences in the residential uh, population as it relates to the uh, data from the American Community Survey, and it speaks to uh, factors of potential criminogenic factors, law enforcement resources are al allocated, and officer bias. And I just think it's also important to include other non-law enforcement factors such as retail sectors, tourism uh, locations, and uh, employment sectors that also draw in uh, members from outside of a residential community that may, that do uh, also affect population demographics uh, in those that are stopped. So just to acknowledge that there are um, additional factors, it does say limited or it does include but not limited to. I just think we should uh, maybe call some of those out a little more specifically in the report. But again, um, the report is uh, comprehensive. Um, it is all of 242 pages, and it's probably just the without any appendix. So it'll probably be another um, uh, voluminous report, uh, chock full of very valuable information. And I appreciate DOJ's uh, time and investment uh, in completing the report. Thank you. All right. Any further comments from board members? Okay. All right. Well, then perhaps we'll go on to public comment uh, about the about the report or anything else. So we'll we'll um, start again. Why don't we start in Northern California this time, and we'll go we'll go south. Any comments from Northern California? Seeing none, how about Central California? All right, so we'll go to Southern California. I see Mr. Uh, Hilton unmuted. Yes, I have a lot to talk about, but I won't right now. I do commend Commissioner Ochoa for um, hitting on some very important points. And these are things that had I or you had narratives and read the narratives or analyzed the narratives, you'd have come to very much the same conclusions. As it stands, the DOJ continues to refuse to turn over narratives for the reason that they contain OII and PII. I repeat to the DOJ, and I repeat specifically to Sheriff Ayub, 
that it is the responsibility of both of them to remove the OII and PII that I believe has been deliberately placed in those narrative fields so as to refuse the disclosure of them. Again, Ayub's people have asked me to pay for it. I can't afford it, and I won't, because it's against the law for him to do that. I embraced to hear, because I have not read, that policing in the pandemic is included in this new report. I will tell you what it says. It says that disparities increased even though the number of stops decreased. Um, several minutes ago, Professor said, Professor Raphael said, that the data is available on the Open Justice website. I would like to know just what data that is. It certainly is not data for 2020. It may be data for 2019. If it is there, it has recently been placed there. I tell you what my experience has been. I have asked for that data from the CHP and the Oakland corruption or glitches or transmission problems, select the word, and I have yet to receive it in its entirety. What I did receive is a partial submission that showed that almost 10,000 CHP records were in it in the correction that had not been there before. So, the data is fluid. As for Oakland, well, they are a remarkable lot, and I have not seen their data, and I expect not to see their data until it's too late for me to act on it. So, if um, someone can clarify what data the professor speaks about, that would be helpful to me. I think that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hilton. Are there any further comments from Southern California? Hey, well, not seeing any. Why don't we move on to our next item or on the agenda, which is action items and discussion of next steps. And I believe we have at least two that perhaps we can discuss on. I'm not sure if we we necessarily have a, a motion or something to vote on, but we we have the discussion regarding the letter that I believe Anna put the, the text of the letter that was sent a few years ago about PC 148.6. And then also uh, perhaps further discussion of if we want to take some action with regards to the advisory letter on AB 846. So why don't we open those up and then anything else anyone wants to raise? Andrea? Yes, yeah, so I, th I think that's good. And I would uh, just say that the other next step is that the the committees will be doing another round of meetings, and so we will be, I, I believe that will be the last um, round of committee meetings for the year, and the, the public is welcome to participate in all of those, um, and that will be prior to us making, a, doing a final review of the, of the report in our December meeting. And so I think we're, we're making good progress, um, and, uh, Regarding the letters, I given that where we are in the year, where you know the legislative season for the year has ended, um, I think that uh, it would be fine to send a letter that wraps up all of the legislative recommendations all together, um, and to do so as a transmittal letter with a report. Um, 
I think would be, you know, would be fine um, to arrive on January 1st, which is when the report is published. So I think a, a single letter that that wraps up all things would, would be fine to let the legislature know what our for both uh, new recommendations and outstanding recommendations. A quick point of clarification. I see the letter in the packet is addressed to post, Commission on Post, who oversees the background process as the rulemaking body for uh, background investigations, as opposed to the legislature. So it, it and I think the post could probably enact these recommendations uh, regards to AB 846 uh, more expeditiously than going back to the, to the legislature uh, since they, since post has that authority. So I would, um, you know, I think we should consider just sending the 846 letter directly to post. Let me just clarify, the 846 letter is essentially a public comment from the board during their um, regulatory process, which closes on the 25th. Similar to how we did the public comment from the board on the DOJ's uh, RIPA amendments. So it's in response to post public comment uh, period on 846 implementation, is that accurate? Yes, because they have proposed regulations and our comment is um, responding to the proposal. Yeah, thanks for that clarification. Yeah, I, so so much is in my head. Great idea. So, do we have a motion for the board to approve the contents of the letter? To I imagine it has to be entered into the record either at a public meeting or do we send a letter, just procedurally? But perhaps we should just uh, start by saying, do we have a motion to? Have that be an official communication from the RIPA board. I'd like to move that that's a communication from the full RIPA board. I want a second. Okay. Hey, shall we shall we go through a vote? Sorry, just for clarification for minutes purposes, who who made the second? I'm with made a second. Thank you. So I can uh, perhaps I'll just call everybody and you could. Uh, perhaps I'll just call everybody. Um, how about uh, board member Ray? Yes, I approve the vote. Okay, and Board Member Hawkins. I approve. Board Member Swing, and my co-chair. Board Board Member Kulkarni. Approve. Okay, Board Member Woods. Uh, board Member Ayub. Yes. Board member Kajabi. Hey, okay, I approve. Board member Guerrero. Yes. Board member Bang. Sorry, I hope I pronounced your name correctly. You're right, Bang. Yes. Board member Ochoa. Oh, yes. I'm a yes, and I believe uh, Board Member Kennedy. Yes. And I think I missed anybody. Uh, I would vote yes as well. Armaline, William. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So I believe that's your unanimous. That passes. How about with regards to PC 138.6, this is the issue regarding complaints and the, the prior communication to the legislature. Perhaps we want to wrap you that in. Sorry. 
when we oh. um, looked at it, we did review the boards um, identified over the um, the best practice over the um, last four years, the past four years. So that was taken into consideration when it came to this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So I, I, wonder, suggesting that, I wonder that we update the recommendation to to include uh, a reflection of of additional information. I just wonder if there's. I just a, wonder. I'm sorry, Luan. I didn't mean to interrupt. I'm sorry. Um, we're asking for it to be added, to, legislated to add it to the state law. Um, just our, those three recommendations. One was a tracking number, which should not be that pro, um, hard for them to do these things. And the board has identified over the uh, past four years that we believe the legislation should do it. And they said, this is the best practice, that it needs to be added to law. That 148.6 be removed. And Luanda, what was the third one? I didn't so hear you. A, oh, I'm sorry. We have a tracking number. Remove PC 148.6. Uh, because course, we believe it, deter, it deters people from filing a complaint. And we don't know if it really has to be on the complaint form or not. Yeah, we really don't know. Can it just be on their website? Uh, will that be sufficient? But we do believe everyone should, who files right. a complaint in the state yeah, of California so should be given. Yeah, and I, you know, just the board has already um, concurred with with that opinion. They've already sent a letter. So I think the question now is, um, what do we do to elevate that with the legislature? And so I think it. My suggestion is that we we transmit the report with a letter that says these are our recommendations because I, I believe there's some new ones that are, are going to emerge from the report and we reiterate this recommendation that we made previously see attached letter um, and um, urge you to act on this recommendation uh, for these reasons so i don't think we need to to, to, to re, uh, rediscuss our position on it, because we already stated what our position is on it. I think it's just a, a strategy question about how do we elevate it. Well, I, you know, one, one path, so I'm happy, and I don't, perhaps we don't need a, a vote to do this, but I could work with DOJ staff and, and co-chair Swing, and we can perhaps draft a letter to communicate that could be delivered along with the report to the legislature, and we will re-up the content of the last communication from, I believe it was 2019, that, that uh, Anna kindly found for us. And, uh, and how does that sound for a path forward? Or do we need a vote on that as well? I think for clarity purposes, just so there is very clear direction, it might be helpful to have a vote on whether the board approves the co-chairs to work with DOJ on a transmittal letter that transmitting the current recommendations in the report and the past recommendations that the board has made as well to the legislature. Okay. Well, I'll make that motion. Okay. I'll make that motion. I will second that motion. Okay. So let's let's go. Let's have a vote. Um, Board Member Guerrero. Aye. Uh, Board Member Carney. Aye. Board Member Swing. Just create Aye. more work for you. <laughs> Board Member Hawkins. Board Member Ayu. Aye. Okay. Board Member Ray. 
Hey, just confirming that we're recommending that the board was the deal. Every time I'm in Saving Christ. That's only up like a mile, man. <laughs> Are you kidding? Where's those? Raphael, if, if we can just ask if if someone's not actively engaged in conversation to mute, there's some background. Um, I'm unable to hear Commissioner Ray. Okay. Yeah. Right, yes, I was just confirming that we're voting that we're, the board is just going to work with DOJ to resubmit what we've already submitted, right? Not on anything new, correct? To re, well, to re-up what, what we submitted in the past and then also to convey formally via letter the recommendations from our, from our current report. So it'll okay. be a, a separate communication to the legislature. Okay, I approve that, yes. Thank you. Okay, uh, board member Vang. Yes. Board member Kajabi. Yes. Board member Woods. Uh, board member Woods. Aye, yes, oh, double okay. yes. <laughs> board member Ochoa. Yes. And I think Pastor Kennedy, I'm looking for him on the line. It's funny, the first time I ever talked to him, I was going to eating garden. So how are y'all? Okay, and I'm a yes, so that, that passes as well. Okay, are there any... Are you still on the line oh, too? I just want to make sure he gets a chance to vote as well. Thanks, yes. <laughs> okay. Thank you. I'm sorry. Sorry, Dr. Armelina. I'm just seeing, I'm looking at the, at the, at the on videos. Sorry about that. Okay. All right. Are there any other action items or, or, or further steps, next steps? I guess we can open the floor for anyone who wants to offer a suggestion. I will, I'd just like to um, underscore how grateful we are to the public for participating all the year long. We're in the final home stretch. We have a few months to go and this next phase is really important and we're requiring that we can get a product out to the public. You. Thanks, of course, so much to the DOJ staff for, for all your incredible work uh, analyzing the data and, and calling and summarizing all this research and, and, and just drafting this amazing report that year after year is just becoming more and more of a, of a you know, a, a very, very, very substantive analysis of lots of important things, so really appreciate it. Okay, so uh, are there any further comments? Okay, if not, I believe we can uh, adjourn a little early. Everybody gets an hour uh, or so back of their day. So again, thank you everybody. Thank you DOJ staff and my fellow board members for, uh, for your dedication and for devoting your time and to the public for, for showing up and, and providing your feedback. Thank you, Dr. Raphael. Okay. Have a great, uh, great week to all. Thank you. Thank okay. you, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Raphael and Chief Thank you. Thank you.